Well, ladies and gentlemen, since all of you are seated and uh, the panel is here, let's begin a little early. Writer Elif Butterman, classicist Tom Holland, and poet Ashok Vajpayee discuss the meaning of a classic with leading cultural theorist Professor Homi Baba. Please welcome them. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Lovely to see such a large group of people to discuss what sounds like an unpromising, fusty, old-fashioned topic. What is a classic? I thought we would only have the 80s and above, but we have a lively audience, and I hope we have a very lively session. With me today is Elif Batuman, a writer in residence at Koch University. Uh, whose book, The Possessed Adventures with Russian Books and People Who Read Them, was a finalist for a National Book, Cir a book Critic Circle Award. Ashok Vajpayee, who I always describe as the man who keeps the flame of culture burning in New Delhi against the odds of bad winds and bad fate, but succeeds each time, is Hindi poet and critic, translator, editor, and cultural activist, a major cultural figure in India, really needs no introduction, but he does need to be mentioned each time because his influence has been so remarkable. Christopher Ricks is Warren Professor of the Humanities and co-director of the Editorial Institute at Boston University, a celebrated controversialist and indeed a great critic. Um, uh, uh, an editor, I first read you when I read your Tennyson uh, uh, edition as an undergraduate at Oxford. That does not age him in the least bit. He is remarkably vivacious and lively for his young ear. Yes. Uh, finally, Tom Holland is the author of Rubicon, Persian Fire, and Millennium, all of which explore dramatic moments in the history of ancient imperialism. I think we have amongst us then uh, people from a whole range of regions and places where the classic has had a particular resonance. Now, let me just start with a very basic definition of the classic. The classic is a work that survives its own history, transcends its own time, goes beyond its particular cultural references and regional locations, and moves on to become something of what we might now call a global phenomenon. The Iliad, the Mahabharata, and several other more contemporary texts have this kind of classical status. Sometimes we call it a canon. It might be worth speculating this afternoon whether classics are works that do not simply transcend their time, but are significant because they are works of a great imaginative confusion they can barely understand the significant moments in which they're being written and therefore are open to interpretation over time. This is just an idea I thought that we might speak about. But before we get into the argument, I'd like to go around this stage and ask each of you about your own experience with a classic. Very often one is handed a classic, Dickens or Tagore, by a member of the family and said, read this, this is a classic, or by the school. I want you to talk about the most significant classic that was handed down to you, and then about a classical work that you discovered, or somebody who you thought ought to have a classic status, but didn't. Ashok. Well, I am reminded of Italo Calvini's, Calvino's definition. He said a classic is a book everybody talks about and nobody reads. Um, a friend of mine, you are Anant Murthy, who has just been named for some Booker Prize. Uh, many years uh, when we were already graying, uh, he said, Ashok, if you haven't written your classic by the age of 45, you're unlikely to write it now. So all classics, therefore, by that definition, must have been written before you are 45. And then I started remembering that barring perhaps Yeats and maybe Rilke, 
who wrote some great poetry uh, after 45. Uh, most of their, most other writers who wrote these wonderful, what is known as classics, have been written before they turned 45. So now the only chance of a classic is with the lady, uh, uh, and, and not with you, on any of us anyway. Now, I remember growing up in a central Indian town, in a lower middle class family, the first classic that was handed over to me was Ram Charit Manas mm. by Tulsi Das. And uh, I didn't understand it, but my grandfather used to recite it without a break for nine hours. And I ventured, as uh, I think I was nine or ten year old, to sit with him and keep on doing it. Now, even he didn't understand what he was reciting, and I, of course, couldn't have understood. So I, and then, of course, when you go into the school and this, that, and the other, and then you're handed over, uh, all kinds of things. But to start yeah. with, I would say, although classic is thought to be something which happened in the past, I mean, it can be said that none of us is likely to become a classic, but that's putting everything in the past. But on the other hand, classic is something which goes on in future. Right. It tends to go to the future, whether it aspires to do so or not. But that's, I think... Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashok. That's very helpful. Is Bob Dylan a classic, uh, uh, Christopher? One of the troubles with classic is that it is tempted to monopolize greatness. If by a classic, which is not the same as classic, of course, if by a classic you mean certain things, then you have some real problems because classicism exists, as does romanticism. And the very greatest writers have not been categorizable as either classic or romantic. Yeah. So something bad happens, I think, if we, if we don't watch the fact that classicism and its bodies of virtues needs all the time to be held in tension with romanticism and its bodies of virtues. Romanticism gives a particular place to imagination and excitement, and classicism gives a particular place to discipline and order, and the very greatest works, the works of Wordsworth, for example, are as remarkable for classical virtues and powers as for romantic ones. So that for me is one difficulty. The second difficulty is always about if definition. What is a classic, if you set it up like that, only makes sense for me if I know why we are being asked about it. Correct. Now, what is fiction matters because there is a man book a prize for fiction, mm. and they need to know whether you're eligible or not. What is a book matters because there are books for the prizes for your first book of poetry. So you better be able to define a book. In the case of classicism, I'm not sure that what is a classic will turn out to be the way to organize in the most effective way what we're doing today. Uh, just one last thing. Um, what are we doing today then? Uh, pontificating. Right. In that um, case, we <laughs> should actually stick to the question. Um, the, the very great work of literature, which most mattered to me when I was a child, was Paradise Lost. Now that is, of course, marked immediately by the snobbery which was, of course, part of my life. I was at boarding school from 8 to 18. I wished to distinguish myself from the people who were, work who were reading comic books. And you could do that by reading Paradise Lost, which is the greatest work of science fiction in the English language, and many, many other things. But it isn't classical, because it was known in the 17th century to have affronted many of the very, very clear notions of what constituted classicism. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Tom, you know, my question is less about classicism and romanticism as, as, as modes or historical forms, more about works from either of those traditions that develop a certain kind of canonicity. Well, I, as a classicist, obviously, I would go right back to the classical. Yes. Um, I mean, that is where the word comes from. Right. In, in Latin, um, it is a cl classis means a class of person, or it can mean a, a class of school children, and a classicus can be either a scholar or um, somebody who pays the top whack rate of tax. Um, and the first, the first writer to use the word in our sense is a, a chap called Aulus Gellius who writes in the second century AD and he, 
he describes another writer as, as, as a scriptor classicus, a, a writer who is a classic. You know, he's, he's the top end. He's the equivalent of a top end In the taxpayer. sense in which... Yes, yes. so, it, so it's, it's, it, immediately there is that sort of tone of wealth and privilege and social status attached to yes. the idea of a classic. And that then, it, it, it's not then mentioned again until the Renaissance, when the Renaissance pick up again on this idea of classics. And of course, what they are doing is counterpointing this inheritance from pagan Greek and Roman antiquity with the Christian inheritance. So in the Renaissance, the Bible, the church fathers are not classics, but Homer and Virgil and so on are. And that's why I think actually that, that the word classic in English is very shaped by its origins in West European Christian culture. And there is always a sort of slight tension in transferring it, say, to India. Um, whether the Mahabharata or the, the Ramayana count as classics in the way that the Iliad and the Odyssey did to people in the Renaissance, because to people in the Renaissance, there was no religious dimension to the Greek epics in right. the way that to, to, to Hindus in India, of course, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are not simply works of literature. They are, they are something more than that. Um, so what was, the, what was the classic that particularly, that, that, I, that I had foisted on me? Well, it was, um, the first one, I suppose, was Alice in Wonderland, uh, which I found absolutely unreadable. And I think this is the great unspoken truth about a lot of children's classics, is that they're best enjoyed in adulthood. Um, and it was really only when I got into the Beatles and John Lennon and I Am the Walrus that I really started to understand Alice in Wonderland. But the, the, the classic that I found for myself was the first great historian um, in any tradition, Herodotus, ancient Greek writer who wrote two and a half thousand years ago, first European writer to mention India, among many other things. Um, and I got into him because I was very interested in ancient Greek warriors fighting each other and sort of slashing each other up. And I wanted to read about um, the wars that Herodotus ostensibly is writing his history about. But when I got Herodotus out of the library, I found to my horror that what I was basically reading was an enormous shaggy dog story. Herodotus begins by saying he's going to tell us about the wars, but then before you know it, he's off describing kings getting cuckolded by their bodyguards and what the Egyptians do with their cats and how the Scythians <laughs> get spliffed up. Um, and it took me a long time to get to the wars. But then gradually, over the course of my life, I discovered that actually I was much more interested in the Scythians getting bonged up and what the e Egyptians did with their cats. And maybe that's the definition of a classic, is that it is a text that grows up with you and reveals itself over the course of your lifetime again and again. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So the classics, the classic in youth, the classic in the romantic distinction, the classic is a work that grows with you and, in fact, accompanies you in life. Elif, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I was very interested by the, the division between two kinds of the classic, the one that's foisted on you in your youth and the one that you discover. And I think that maybe those... I had a, I had a very different experience where I, I loved Alice in Wonderland, but it wasn't foisted on me. And the one that was foisted on me was Treasure Island, and I couldn't <laughs> understand why anyone would, would want to read such I a I love book. Treasure Island. You see? So, I, you know, it, it doesn't have that much to do with the, with the book. Maybe one way of looking at classics is, I was thinking of this at the Shakespeare panel also, where uh, I think Shakespeare is, is a very uh, rigorously imposed part of the Indian educational system. And I noticed this also when I was writing about Dante when I was in Italy, and also I went to Russia and seeing how they view Tolstoy that the, the classic is um, something that's imposed on you from above. But there's also this other way of viewing a classic, which is that there's this field of, of discovery that you go out and find your way in it, and that becomes the classic for you, of course, the one that, that grows up with you. And I was wondering if that might correspond to two different, two different ways of how, how classics come about, because when you study canonicity, there's kind of two ideas. One is that there's you know, sort of this Wilhelm Meister, like that there's a tower somewhere where these things are being decided and imposed on everyone from above. And then there's, a, there's sort of an evolutionary, either a Darwinian or a marketplace view of how classics evolve because they have certain formal features or because they're, you know, something about them appeals to the, the marketplace in a certain way or... Um, yeah, and those are two very, very different Thank ways. Thank you. And and can, yeah. I, um, can I actually move from something you said and ask the panel, uh, do, do classics have to have a kind of national or regional or proto-national uh, context uh, from which they emerge? Do they have to tell the story 
mythological or otherwise, of a particular region, a particular historical moment. And as we progress into the 19th century, more or less across the world, late 19th century, then do classical works, uh, Promessi Sposi uh, s suggests itself to me, have to, be, have to have a, that national resonance in order to gain some kind of authority? Well, uh, in some sense, yes, a classic uh, is expected and more often than not does use a narrative which is largely national or regional. But I think a classic is one which not only exists in itself, it also exists elsewhere. That is in other works. I mean, Mahabharata exists in itself, but it also exists in a large body of literary works of absolute classical nature of first rate. It should be uh, translatable across. It should be. Therefore, a classic is not which is confined within right. its own limits. This is one point I wanted to make. And the other is sometimes a classic may epitomize a culture. At other times, perhaps, it can radically question that culture. Right. And it could uh, as well be. Uh, the classic example, of course, Sir Ricks would know better that Paradise Lost was written uh, in the own words to justify ways of God to man. And there has been that instead of justifying ways of God to man, it landed up by justifying ways of Saturn to God uh, in, in a certain sense, which is a highly non-Christian uh, aspiration. The classics, therefore, can also be radical. Good. Thank you. Uh, the radical classic. Christopher, do you want to get to talk about uh, about the national or regional context of classics? Well, I think if you, if you move to the national question, you move not from the general question of what is a classic, what attains or achieves classic status, but to particular kinds of literature, uh, for instance, the epic, and the epic does have to have a huge national basis. It, it has to tell a story. It has to be on a certain scale. But greatness, enduring greatness, does not have to belong in any one genre or kind. It really doesn't, or of course, any one art. So that when earlier you say, is it necessary, is it essential that such and such? It seems to me of the nature of works of genius that there is no one thing that we can identify without which it couldn't possibly succeed. Yes. Uh, you're always learning that such and such an art cannot achieve unless it does so and so. Right. And then somebody comes along and the mark of his or her genius is that it doesn't do so and so. Uh, and you have to think again about whether there is ever one thing necessary. There are always two things necessary and this is Coleridge on imagination. Imagination is the balance or reconciliation of opposite or discordant qualities bringing together things which are exceptionally difficult to bring together, like enthusiasm and discipline. In fact, I'd like you, uh, to, if you would, to take up this issue of disparate things coming together, because it goes to the other notion of the classic that I was trying to talk about, one which is a work of imagined confusion, contention, contradiction. Well, I, I think that... Um, I think that that's all true, and I think that there's certainly a sort of that, that, that classics can play a radical, subversive role. But I think that we should also emphasise that um, they are sort of an appurtenance of a great civilization, and great civilizations often feel that they should have great works of literature, rather in the way that they have sort of battle fleets or satellites or whatever. Um, and I guess the first, you know, the, the, the first example of this is that um, when the Romans conquer the Greek world, they stand of, in awe of, of Homer and the achievements of the Greek tragedians um, who are the product of the Athenian imperial age. And they think, well, hey, we should have a, a national epic of our own. Yeah. Uh, and Caesar Augustus basically tells Virgil, the greatest poet of his day, go ahead and write one. And amazingly, Virgil does. And it is, the Aeneid is the great epic of, of the Roman Empire, of Latin literature. It is simultaneously praising the Roman achievement and subtly undermining it at the same time. So it, it fulfills both those qualities. But what's interesting about the Aeneid is that although it is probably the poem that has had the single greatest influence on the subsequent course of Western literature, certainly, it has had virtually no impact on any other literature. Mm. Uh, the Greeks are utterly contemptuous of it. Um, it is not, it does not, the, the Arabs are not interested in it. It doesn't sort of migrate as far as India. 
um, in, whereas, whereas Homer does. So, um, and and the, the nation states of Europe, when they then started building empires, were aware of the fact that they sort of needed an Aeneid equivalent. Right. And you could argue that the, you know, the British equivalent of that is Shakespeare. Now uh, let's change tack here. And let's talk about, let's speculate, let's guess. Um, what might be, Elif, for you, and I want sharp, short, just so because we can have the, uh, the discussion later, M name a contemporary work by any of these definitions, I don't care which, that I've has I've been sitting here you. preparing to answer the previous question and now I get put on the spot with yeah, identifying yeah, I put you on the something spot. very yeah, quickly. Uh, yeah, well, that's the one right eye. You could come up, but mention something. I'm mentioning something contemporary. Uh, some, something contemporary which has the status. I don't care which definition. Which has the status of summing up something about a culture which is a contradictory text, which is something that has a national reference, what would you mention? I think, you know, all ten of the authors who we named on the Man Booker International Prize yesterday are, are authors who we think are doing that in one way or another, and they're all living, and they're all, you know, that's my short Tom, answer. Tom, would you mention some a contemporary writer or an art? I don't I even know. Am I allowed to mention the Rushdie word? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I Are you allowed to mention uh, the Rushdie word? What, on, uh, what not, kind of a question is that? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to cite the Stanic Verses, but I will cite Midnight's Children yes. as a novel that I think um, was simultaneously subversive and celebratory and um, as an Anglo-Indian work, a work that is rooted both in Mumbai and London is expressive of a new order of reality and I think that that is what great that's classics should do. Thank you very much. That's, exa that's very, very helpful. Christopher, would you like to say something about Bob Dylan here or not? <laughs> he clearly wants me to say something about Bob Dylan. Christopher has done um, some excellent work um, on Bob Dylan. I think that the song on his last album, Tempest, the title song, Tempest, is a work of genius. It's a 14-minute song. It's characteristic of works of genius that they make irrelevant the question of whether they are classics or not. They're works of genius. It doesn't matter how you categorize it. It is a 14-minute ballad about the sinking of the Titanic, and it never mentions the iceberg. Ashok, a I contemporary classic. I would mention a long poem done by a Hindi poet, Gajanan Madhav Muktibodh, called Andhere Me. It's translated into English by Krishmal Devayad as In Darkness. I think that is a classic. If there has to be a classic in the last 50 years, it has all the elements which have been mentioned. It is radical, it is affirmative, it is interrogative. It gives a very wide picture of the underbelly of Indian society. For my money, I, I put my money on Conrad, yes. who I think uh, was one of the first global writers, uh, really took a measure of the world uh, in a language that continually reflects other languages. There is a kind of Francophile, there's a Russian Conrad, there's a, and uh, somebody who actually, by doing that, then went back to something that Christopher says and produced a work that produced works that were not easily definable in any one genre or indeed in any one mode. Uh, and, uh, and also then generated classics in turn. Exactly. Because we're not just talking about literature. If we think about the impact of Heart of Darkness on, on Apocalypse Now as a sort of great classic film, right. there is a sense in which Heart of Darkness has been mythologized as the great primal work on imperialism and has fed into ways that imperialism is understood in a whole multitude of, of new classic works. And I think that must be one characterization of a classic is that it does breed Generate. further classics. Absolutely, yes. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, Elif. Would you like to think about that sort of, you know, classics that have generated other classics, not necessarily in their own genre, but in other genres? I do think that's a very good definition of a classic, is a, a work that produces other classics. Um, you know, um, it's, it's actually quite interesting how Walter Benjamin said that the survival of literary works is often that they, that they get put into other medium. And you were actually saying that yourself. Um, 
What about the, uh, fi I want to open up to the audience, but before we do that, I'd um, want to return, um, um, Tom, to the earlier definition you gave of the status, you know, the social status of the classic work. Uh, we, understand, we know this because in universities, certain texts in certain periods of time are must-reads. You know, you have to do it, otherwise you don't, you, you don't progress. But that's a different kind of, you know, that can, canonicity is different, isn't it, from the earlier notion that a classical writer was one who paid more taxes. Well, I, I think it was, it was implicit in um, Professor Ricks' account mm. of him reading uh, Paradise Lost at school because it was sort of prestigious and yes. classy. I think that um, in, 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 uh, in ancient Greece and Rome, um, particularly in Rome, um, it cost a lot of money um, and it, it required you to be very, very upper class to have the time to devote yourself to the study of literature. So the study of literature in itself was an elite activity. Um, and in the 18th and the 19th century, the time in your teenage years to study Greek and Latin so that you could read these classics in the original language again was an elite activity. And I think that um, one of the ways in which the understanding of a classic has changed over the past 40 years um, is that it has been globalized and it has become more democratic. Um, you know, we can talk seriously about um, lyrics um, of pop songs as classics. We can talk about a classic advert. We can talk about a classic kind of soft drink, a classic uh, computer. Um, and there is a sense in which the postmodernism of particularly the 21st century has really recalibrated our understanding of a classic and removed it from that sort of old, antique, and even 18th century understanding of it as something elite. John, surely a classic computer I is a different kind of thing from a classic book. Well, I think, I think the, meani the, the meaning is, is mutating. Um, the meaning and, and is mutating. And that's the sort of the definition of, 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 of the modernity that we live in, is that definitions are never stable. No, They're no, constantly shifting and altering. And so the standing of classics inevitably will change with No, it. the definitions, you're absolutely right, are never stable. And yet there are appropriate and more and less appropriate uses in, the, in relation to particular objects. Let's open up to the audience. I'm sure there are many of you, there you are, who have uh, read classics and want to ask questions about them. Is somebody going to, I think we need more than one mic bearer. Um, I was wondering, you know, we've been told by our teachers and our, our um, parents that read this classic is good for you. And, um, you know, I, I love them now as an adult, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that means that classics are good for us. Or bad for you. You can take it either way. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, classics are good for us. Um, well, I think the thing that's really good for us is is that experience of discovery, of going out and finding our own classic, and you know, perhaps having something forced on us when we're not quite ready for it is enables that in a way. And in that sense, it's good for us. But I. I there's, there's been a trend, maybe not right now, maybe it was sort of ten, 10 years ago where the vogue was to say that reading great books makes us better people and that what makes classics is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, ethical quality that they teach us humanity and, and a larger point of view. And I, I definitely don't agree with that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think it, uh, what, there was a quote, which I now don't remember where it came from, but you know, most, I think it's from Henry James in Portrait of a Lady, that m most things are good for you, and, and the things that aren't, you know, because they're very disagreeable. <laughs> yes. W w when, when, I, when I was um, 14, I resented having um, classics foisted on me, but now that I am the father of a 14-year-old girl, I've started doing it myself, and I, um, I made her read some poems by Tennyson. That's the kind of hip parent I am. Um, and I made her read uh, Tears, Idle Tears, I Know Not What They Mean. And then her best friend left school to go to another school and she was utterly distraught. Um, and one of, the, one of the greatest moments of my parenting life was when she came to me and said, I'm so glad you made me read this poem. I've been reading it over and over and sobbing. Tears, idle tears. So I feel incredibly proud that, that, that in fact my cracking the whip did enable her to enjoy her misery that little bit much more and I, I, I <laughs> yeah the title of that should be classics can make you cry <laughs> yes. uh, Christopher are classics good for you 
Is there a kind of moral thing about it? Well, everything in life can be seen and should be seen under a moral aspect, but also under a spiritual aspect and an economic aspect and a psychological aspect. One, simply one of the ways in which we should look at things. I'll quote a sentence from the writer who is for me the greatest writer of the 20th century, Samuel Beckett. Um, and the sentence is simply this, that you need to know, it's on the first page of one of his short fictions, uh, the old woman uh, her body will not respond to, her, to the brain's commands. Such helplessness to move, she cannot help. Now that for me is a very great sentence. It's based on Parkinson's disease, but it could be based on many things. Such helplessness to move, she cannot help. And what it brings before you is that it is not surprising that you feel exasperation in the face of terrible bodily decrepitude in people that you love. You are, it is natural that you feel exasperation because unless you were exasperated, you would think the situation were completely hopeless. Such helplessness to move, she cannot help. Thank you. That's very moving. You know, the word classical in India has never been used or literature. Uh, the word has used here for music and dance. So there's classical music, there's classical dance. And since the word has been used there more often than in literature, it occurs to me that for me, one of the greatest movements, <coughs> and continues to be, those movements come back, is listening to the classical music of Malikarjun Mansur and Kumar Gandhar. And for me, it's both liberates me from my loneliness, but it also makes me part of a larger community which I do not have direct access to. It makes me feel both human and daringly imaginative. That's what the classic does anyway. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, this is to the panel in general. Uh, sorry, look, um, could you, you to speak up a bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, isn't the concept of uh, classic a relatively subjective issue? That is, any body of work that's had a transforming role, that's played a really radical role in transforming you as a person or your perspective on life. I mean, isn't it beyond definition? Is a classic, uh, isn't the classic a very subjective thing? Anything that has had a great influence on you could have that status as a work. Uh, I, I think that a classic um, reflects the accumulated weight of opinion, perhaps both of the ages and of um, the contemporary, um, and that without that, a work cannot be considered classic. I mean, a work, you, you could be the only person who reads a work. It could be a, a work of utter genius, but unless it has the imprimatur of approval um, of a much broader range of judges, I don't think it can be defined as a classic. I mean, there's a difference between a work of genius and a classic. Christopher, do you agree with that? Well, the I, didn't, I didn't hear the question altogether well, but did it include the word subjective? Uh, excuse me, <laughs> that wasn't meant to be as aggressive as it may have sounded. Uh, the human race got on very well without the contrary terms subjective and objective for millennia. And they are not good terms because they divide everything into the world into what is either merely an individual opinion or is an indisputable fact. Uh, literary judgments are judgments between living people and dead people. They're judgments of a very extraordinary kind and they are neither subjective nor objective. So that I'd want to get, I mean, I understand the impulse behind the question, but the word, those words are very, very dangerous. And William Empson vowed never to use them except when quoting somebody else. Um, I have a question. Um, there are a lot of artists uh, out here in the audience, a lot of Indian artists, and I think a lot of us were also expecting to hear Anish Kapoor, uh, probably because it would have been nice to also have a discussion around uh, what constitutes a classic when you're looking at it from an art perspective. And I was wondering, uh, Mr. Baba, since you write so prolifically about art and you've written about artists, maybe if you could talk a little bit for those of us over here who are more artistically inclined. Thank well, you. Uh, yeah, well, um, we, we do have another panel that I'm moderating at 6 o'clock this evening called The Artist's Eye, and we will certainly 
be talking quite a lot about art uh, in, in that panel. You know, but since you asked me, I think that one of the criteria that I take from this discussion into the world of art is the, uh, is, what, is the fact that a significant work, you can call it a classic or not, but a significant work, a work of some influence, um, does not, uh, it does, prevents people from copying it or reproducing it, but inspires people to move, to move around it, to negotiate it, and to produce something beside it, which is not necessarily, does not fall in its shadow or isn't its reflection, but opens up another way. So one of my uh, the ways I think about a classic is a classic is a, like a fine work of translation, which is not slavishly tied to a text. As Walter Benjamin said, a translation always takes a, a text and replants it in a new soil, and a new plant emerges. So I think a work that resists imitation, but radically produces alternatives to itself, responses to itself, is a work that has a classic status. And that classic status may not always add up to the same meaning as the originating work or the work of inspiration, but it adds to the sentence. It takes that thought further. That, I think, is a gesture of a classic, is one gesture of a work that has a classic status. Question here, lady in turquoise. The lady in turquoise needs a mic. Thank you very much. It's wonderful hearing all you men and your views on what constitutes a classic uh, and your definition. But if Elif would like to complete the first uh, the, uh, her answer, her response to the first question <laughs> that Dr. Baba uh, addressed. Um, we would love to hear from you, Elif. Elif, please address the first question. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm not sure which question it, it was. Why don't you ask Elif a question instead of using a man's question for a woman to respond to? I'm, not going, a I'm not going to respond to that one. No, um, you should. The question that was asked by Dr. Baba, the first one about what, according to you, constitutes a classic, what in your opinion is a classic, and one classic that you would consider uh, in your experience to be uh, a classic and why? Oh, yes, I... Uh, uh, <laughs> you did answer it. I, um, I, I do like very much the definition of a classic as a classic as a book that, that generates other classics. Um, for me personally, the, the discovery, the way that it happened was the, the Russian novel, it was, it was Anna Karenina. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna- I'm Elif, gonna may I ask you, do you like the new film of Anna Karenina? I haven't seen it. Ah. I've seen the trailer, with a classic trailer. I see. Um, <laughs> and I've seen the clothing line by, from Banana Republic. What did you think of the clothing line? Well, I, I was asked to Since comment Tom on it. Since Tom tells us now that you know classics, you can have classic clothes, you can have classic works. Well, it was, it was an interesting project. I was asked to comment on it because I'm, I'm on Twitter and my Twitter name is Banana Karenina. So when <laughs> Banana Republic came out with a clothing line based on Anna Karenina, many people clamored to me for my opinion on the subject. And I thought it was very odd. I thought that, um, you know, there was... Uh, I, I was wondering how they would do it. Would it be, it was sort of the question of staging. Where, would they choose the clothes that Anna had actually worn? The only one that I thought I recognized was, you know, the dress that she might have been beheaded in. And I thought, oh, you know, looks goes great with a severed head. Um. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. I think one of the features of a classic is that it is translated again and again through different periods for different people. I started considering uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, a classic long time ago. And I have now in my possession 13 English versions done in the last 15 to 20 years of Rainer Maria Rilke's two great poems, the Sonnets to Orpheus and Duono Elegies. And it is incredible that time and again, people, uh, yesterday, I think si Simon was making this point, that poets, when they get a bit tired of their own voice, take to translation and try to discover a new voice through the translation. And most of the times these translations are translations of classics. 
Thank you very much. Your question, please. Um, do any of you think that works of popular fiction or genre fiction could fit the definition of, uh, of a classic? And if so, what would be your pick? Popular fiction. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think, I think that the, probably the, the, the great abiding popular classic of the 20th century will be Lord of the Rings. No. And one of the reasons for that is that it is, again, very self-consciously in a literary tradition. Um, what Tolkien was doing was an attempt to demonstrate that epic could still have a purchase in the age of the modern novel. And so he drew on the traditions of Gothic and um, Anglo-Saxon literature. Um, and so the is. world of the Lord of the Rings is not just a fantasy, it is um, a drawing together of a whole stream of um, pre-novelistic traditions. And the fact that it has been such a bestseller, I think, demonstrates the success of what he was trying to do. And I think that it will abide for that reason. Could I suggest, if you want to ask a question, I think you'd be more successful if you stood, because it's very difficult for the mic bearer to see you if you don't. Yep. <coughs> yeah. Uh, one idea coming up is that uh, classic should be good or teach us something. And everything teaches us in one way or another. But the popular philosopher Alan Botton has started a school of life in London. And where he teaches, he uh, uh, introduces people to Anna Karenina and Madame Bowery, not as works of literature, but as works to learn about relationships. Thank you. Your comments. I have no comment to make. Um, I think this idea that um, the truths are to be found in, um, in literature as opposed to philosophy, again, is, is quite a culturally distinctive one. And what prompts me to say that is the record of translation of Greek classics into Arabic. Um, there was a great tradition of this um, in the golden age of Baghdad, uh, Plato, Aristotle, um, also, uh, Greek classics like Galen, who, could, who, who had sort of medicinal purposes. But what the Arabs of the Golden Age did not translate was Homer, Aeschylus, the tragedians. In fact, the Iliad was not translated into Arabic until, I think, about 1912. Um, whereas in, in, um, in, in the Christian West, the idea that, that, that epic, that drama, that poetry could have a moral potency was part of the inheritance from the classical world that the Muslim world did not buy into. And I think that, um, that, that Alain de Botton um, is, uh, I'm delighted to say, very much the heir to um, a tradition stretching right the way back to um, the last days of the Roman Empire when um, the, the newly Christianized Roman upper classes were trying essentially to work out what do you do with this legacy of classical literature. Um, and they, they essentially argued that there are moral truths to be s discovered there, even though they may not be overtly philosophical or overtly theological. I think I'm going to only take another three or four questions, but the, the yes. Okay. Uh, Homi, hi. My name is Amit Chaudhary. Yes, of course. Now, hi, nice to see you, Amit. Nice to see you, too. Uh, and it's exciting to see all these questions about the classic. just want to add two quick modulations, as quick as I can, yeah. to what... Uh, couple of things that Tom Holland was speaking about. Um, the first was the distinction you made between the European Renaissance view of, let's say, the Greek classic as a secular work in opposition to, say, India, where the Ramayana is um, a sacred work. Uh, so as far as the emergence of the classic in India is concerned, uh, one must sort of take into account the secular moment in which texts like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata move into the secular domain and become secular works. And they continue to be religious works, but they also become grist for the mill for new secular writers emerging in the 19th century. So in the first of this is Michael Modushan and Dutt in Bengal, 1860. Reading Milton, he wants to rework an episode from the Ramayana, having the son of the traditional villain of the Ramayana as the tragic hero after Satan and writes in a letter, I'm about to write an epic uh, based on this character, uh, I hate Rama and his rabble. He says, 
uh, but the mythology f of our ancestors is full of poetry. Now, the word poetry is being used in an Arnoldian way there, but bef a little before Arn Arnold uses the word literature in that way. The second point is about classic computers. Uh, it's fascinating to see the appropriation of certain words like classic, um, world, and let's say the catchphrase all time in contemporary discourse inflected by f the free market. So when we say all time now in the numberless all time lists, we mean 20 years. Uh, when we talk about world music epic now. Epic also. Epic, sorry? epic yeah, also. Yeah. And when, when we talk about world music, we are talking about everything that's on the outskirts of American pop music. So classic might be subject to the same sort yeah. of appropriation. Thank you. I mean, thank you for those moderations. I'm sorry, may I add one thing? There are three ladies in the front here who need to be, uh, who need to be, to get a mic. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. One, two, and three. The lady in, you've been, the lady in yellow and white. You've been standing up in protest for a long time. <laughs> hear me he didn't hear me it's it's a, I, I was going to add something Please. but I'm happy to, that we should have no, more people no, ask I'm questions. sorry I didn't say I was just got focusing on the people in the audience. Yes as, as you should have been I just wanted to add something very quickly that I, li I like that last the, the first of the two previous comments very much and I think that they maybe added some nuance to the you know it's very easy to say a classic is a work that generates other classics but the mecha mechanism of that happening I think is it's very interesting and it comes from a from a sense of dissatisfaction that this a classic is a, is a book that's given to you saying that this describes experience and sometimes as with your 14 year old daughter that's true and when that happens that's a wonderful thing but a lot of times it, it, it you feel it is not true this doesn't describe any of my experience and that's you know that's how Don Quixote came about and I think it relates to Professor Baba's point about imaginative confusion that you know a work like Don Quixote came from the chivalric romance had a certain status as a classic and he felt that did not describe my life experience and that produced another classic which then in turn spawned you know a gazillion Madame Bovary and and, and all the rest of them um, so I, I like that comment very and much. I love I love that you bring in Don Quixote because then we go to Shakespeare's Cardinio, which we don't really know, but comes back to Don, uh, to Don Quixote. Exactly. That's, a that's a great point. Thank you very much. One of my favorite quotes I like to think about is from Hemingway that said... Um, you d you're going to have to speak up a bit. One of my favorite quotes that I like to think about is from Hemingway, who said all great American literature was born from Huckleberry Finn. Uh, and I like to think about what he means when he said that. And I was wondering if you all have interesting examples of books that were born, classical books that were born from other classical writers or books. Well, Gogol has, uh, Dostoevsky has a famous quote that says, we all of us came out from under Gogol's oh, overcoat. So I think there is a sense that there are certain writers who are the overcoat that everyone else comes out of. And Huckleberry Finn, I would add, is sort of the Don Quixote of America, the picaresque road trip of, you know, so it makes sense that that would be something that would spawn a lot of other work. Jean Reese's White Sag SOC comes out of Jane Eyre, um, you know, very directly. Uh, uh, Kurtzia's Foe comes out of Defoe, um, uh, Robinson Crusoe, very directly. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, the, in my opinion, the greatest uh, modern novel is Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Yeah which, um, I mean, to a degree, it is a picaresque novel, so you could say there's a sort of element of Huckleberry Finn, but it's evident that really the inspiration is Milton. Um, and, and that is a, a really powerful example of someone not, you know, the, the anxiety of influence is always there. You think, how on earth am I going to write it? Is it possible to, 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 to use Milton in a way that will not be purely pastiche? But I think that, that Blood Meridian is astounding because it shows that it can be done, and it uses it very creatively to um, to develop a whole new mythology of what is the classic American myth, that of the Wild West, and has really, post Blood Meridian, I think it's very hard to take cowboys in white hats with any seriousness at all. Um, and so I think that, 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 that the maybe another mark of a classic is that it reconfigures myth. I also think that there are two kinds of 
classic, I mean, there's one classic which it comes from imaginative confusion and is the classic that sort of trailblazes a new genre where one didn't exist before. And then there's sort of a late stage classic where there's a refining of a, something that has been going on for a long time. And I think, you know, if you compare Don Quixote to maybe Hamlet, where you feel that one is the perfection of, of it's mm. kind of like mm. with the structure of scientific res mm. revolutions mm. that there's one person who makes an initial step and then there's a large mopping up and then some, you know, depending on what your time is in the, in the historical period that determines the kind of classic that you could write. And, and maybe the, the sort of goggles with the overcoats are at the earlier stage and, and you know, then they all radiate outwards. But I, I think that one of the problems that we face now is that we are suspicious of what is old. We are suspicious of what is classic. Um, so we're sort of torn between wanting to generate new classics, but in a way having a suspicion and a doubt and a feeling of, of, of uncomfortability with the whole notion of it. And Especially that, I think, with is anyone who's new. living still. Yes. Uh, yeah. I would have thought that one of the interesting things today um, is in fact the, that we are not suspicious of the past that we're continually having to deal with the past as, as it emerges in a transformed or translational state in the present. But we're only suspicious of our peers, or exactly. we're particularly <laughs> suspicious of our peers. Yes. I think it's interesting that the contemporary, you know, Tolkien and Conrad are... I'm a classic author. So I want to know to what degree is the exercise of identifying a classic one embedded in that of identifying cultural superiority? Great question. Great question. I would say that, yes, this is true. Uh, it has been done more with Ramayana, less with Mahabharat, because Mahabharat is a more fluid and that it's a more open text. Uh, Ramayana is a comparatively uh, more rigid in that sense, and it has been uh, misused, as you said. But classics can be used in many ways. I am reminded I was in Prague once for the first time. 25 theater houses. 24 of them were having classics, Antigone, Shakespeare, uh, Sophocles, etc. And I asked, but why? Where are contemporary plays? He said, well, in the communist regime, contemporary dissent would not be permissible. So we are using classic to make a radical comment. So there are many uses of classics. And the use itself cannot invalidate the status or the value of the classic. And I, I think I want to add there that, you know, f to, to go back to what Ashok said, that one of the, uh, uh, one of the characteristics of a classic is an, its openness. And I think a number of us have said that. So that, yes, uh, there is a certain reading of Heidegger, which is deeply problematic. Um, but there are other, other, other Heideggers in Heidegger, too. And I think we've always got to be aware of that when before we make... Uh, a, a sort of a judgment about what the social, cultural, uh, ideological manifestations or interpretations of the book. So I think one has to read suspiciously all the time. Um, I think there's a, la a lady in pink and a lady in color. Or with, oh, a lady with lovely pepper and salt hair there. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I was wondering when he said classical music, we don't use classic in India and we use classical. And I don't know whether classics, uh, the difference between classics and classical. Oh no, I mean, I only pointed out that the word classic as it exists in English or in the West does not exist in the Indian tradition. Uh, there are, we coined the word Gaurav Granth and things of that kind, but these are coinages. But for the music that we wanted to, both perhaps in our nationalist favor, fervor, wanted to create an alternative music, and we called it classical. And that created a hiatus between other kinds of music and classical music. But could that's a different issue. Could, could I just answer that as well? Um, the, the, there is, of course, a very significant difference between the use of classic and classical, um, and particularly when applied to art forms other than literature. And it begins pretty late in European languages. Winkelmann, the great art critic, um, beginning of the 19th century, does use the word classical, but he, and even though he's writing about art, he only applies it to literature. And it's only over the course of the 19th century that the word classical gets applied to Greek and Roman art. And then it, as, as an example of, of, you know, of the originatory um, classic uh, period of culture. And it then starts being 
transposed onto music, so classical music and, um, and classical art. And that then gets a transferred to other civilizations. So that by analogy, there are classical periods in Indian music and art. Yeah. There are classic periods in, 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 in Aztec art. Um, Thank you. And it, but but the, the distinction is, is very significant and, and, and right to point it out. Elif, uh, any oh, no, no contribution? Okay. Thank you. No. Um, I have two more. Uh, the man in grey, and we will end with the lady in pink. I think there is a, a classic stance that has to happen here to get noticed. But, um, <laughs> right, my, my question is about the fact that cannot classics be defined as something which we desire to read and desire to know and desire to indulge in rather than being an, imp an imposition and I refer, and I might be drawing this, con this, this co discussion down to a ridiculous level from the sublime to say, Archie comics. For example, these were the comics that taught us what romance was all about. Our first kiss visualization was something which these things did and they've endured over God alone knows how many decades. To be still here today is the first thing that we read under lamplight at night when our parents don't want us to. So can't these types of readings be also called classics? because yes. they are actually what help us grow up. Thank you. You know, I'm going to turn this question not to the panel, but to the audience. How many of you learned to kiss by reading a classic of some kind hidden under your bedclothes at night? How many of you learned to kiss by reading a popular classic? I think I... One... Put your hand. <laughs> one, two, and three. There are just three, though. No, six kisses here. Uh, so, no, this is the eight kisses. Come on, fess up. How many of you learned, learned to do the most... Uh, yeah, there's difference between knowledge and admission, our questioner says. Very few people learn to kiss through literature. What a shame. Yeah. No, there are other uh, ways. Uh, the, the lady in pink. And in fact, I think there are two more. I'm going to allow these two ladies because they've stood and sat and stood and sat. Yeah, they have the persistence of classical works. <laughs> So my question is also uh, probably a little in line with what he was mentioning. I was wondering, you know, children are such an important element of society and uh, uh, Edith Blyton is, uh, in my view, a classic author because she's transcended so many generations, but nobody really made a, uh, you know, mention of her. Is it because she doesn't make for, you know, deep reading and things like that? Why was it that, is she not seen as a classic author, especially in the children's world? Sorry, I didn't hear. Who is the writer you're talking about? Enid Blyton. Enid Blyton. Well, I'm sure that many people um, would think of Enid Blyton as a classic. I, th I think that. that she would have been thought of a classic as perhaps 30 years ago, but she is maybe a classic, a classic example of a classic who has ceased to be a classic because uh -huh times and mores have changed except for the lady in pink you well, see so there are always there are always outposts yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> maintaining have, ancient uh, empires and civilizations you, you, you really have to be very brief because i'm really stretching the pushing the envelope at this point very brief make a statement don't ask a question um, actually, I have a question for each of the panelists. Oh, no, impossible. Uh, no, but it's a very short uh, question and very short answer. We started off with uh, asking each of the panelists what uh, is the... Oh. When, when they were younger and, you know, which classic had the most impact on them. Uh, most of us here are uh, people from different backgrounds, people from different educational backgrounds. So I wanted one, a name of one book from uh, each of you uh, for, uh, you know, average uh, readers like us, people from different backgrounds. Okay. Uh, a classic which you would suggest to us, which would make sense to us, and which would hopefully help us understand uh, what we read, understand the world around Thank us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a title. And if you don't feel you have one, you don't have to give one. Anna Karenina and the accompanying clothing collection from Banana Yay. Republic. Yeah. Um, Her Herodotus' Histories, because it is the 5th century BC Wikipedia. Okay. I plead the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> I'd say Mahabharat. John Katsir's greed, as John Katsir's, uh, oh, the great, uh, the disgrace, John Katsir's disgrace. Okay. No more, sorry, we can't go, sorry. I apologize to those I haven't been able to call. I thank all the panelists here. I thank you for your questions. I hope you will go and read and, and, and uh, make new classics as you go and read. Thank you very much for your participation. Many thanks, panelists, for that fascinating conversation, a fascinating session.
Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, authors will be available for book signing next to the bookstore. Please buy your books and get them signed. Thank you.